secret of successful early stage investing is to invest behind founders and companies who are going to succeed anyway so the difference between an idea and a business is that you solve the problems right so many people have great ideas but very few people actually have good businesses there's so many apps so much happening now in fintech across the board as well how do you cut through the clutter the runway is huge the penetration not enough focus on a specific market build the best product out there and then continue to keep expanding and fortunately for all of us india as a market is still growing very healthily so you know how much money nokri raised in its life go ipo 7.3 crores one round uh, and you know how much money we used of the 5 crores so basically young founders unko paiso ki keemat samajh aani chahiye we are a country with you know mouth watering opportunities but eye watering challenges mm. right to tap into those mouth watering <laughs> i like that i, I like that hey guys welcome to the next level podcast today our topic is all things investment okay so uh, folks you know at the next level they've created uh, some interesting profiles of you guys on the app so you can check it out and let me read out some of them uh, kunal for you kunal co-founder of titan capital snap deal titan is a leading early stage in venture capital that has uh, invested in over 280 startups that's a lot an ola urban company mama earth well known for providing strategic direction and support to its portfolio firms in addition to financial investments sounds nice <laughs> <laughs> i was wondering for a minute is it still me <laughs> very Don't true yaar me <laughs> okay with the real kunal bhai please stand up yeah <laughs> uh, what is the support that you provide apart from financial investments <laughs> look at the i mean i that the it's it's better you ask the founders i think it'll be inappropriate for me to be uh, but look at, at in my heart i'm a founder right i'm an operator so the empathy that an operator has okay. for an a founder's journey is actually unmatched yeah. right like obviously investor career investors can also have the empathy but if you are an operator yourself gone through the twists and turns all the near death experiences that i talked about um you know you you know that the founder is looking for people who will cross oceans for them mm. right and as a founder yourself you have come across people who won't even cross puddles for you right <laughs> and and so you know what is it that the founder is looking for and you you try your best to give it to them sometimes you think that's more important i mean of course the sub financial support and everything is hygiene but sometimes these other elements are a little more important right because as founders as especially as early stage founders some of these um um startups they may not even have conviction in themselves with that idea it it is very important i i i hope they do have conviction in themselves <laughs> but uh, but there are definitely moments of doubt mm-hmm. and uh, at that point just having a partner like kunal or sanjeev who who believes in you is the most important thing at that time okay for ishan it is managing director of peak 15 uh, well known well renowned venture capital organization specializing in early investments mama earth grow zomato razor pay freshworks well known for providing strategic direction and support to portfolio firms in addition to financial investments is that you sounds about right <laughs> <laughs> no imposter syndrome like no. kunal <laughs> none none okay um, we actually i mean to, to the point of support uh, see we are uh, multi stage investors so we are partnering at seed at uh, venture and then growth and uh, we actually want to stay longer beyond ipo as well so what we have spent a lot of energy on the support piece is building a world class team of uh, of operators of specialists in different functions to work with the founders that we invest in so we have we have a person who leads our marketing she's uh, gayatri used to be head of uh, hotstar as a head of marketing shweta used to lead policy for uber um, and similarly in finance uh, our head of engineering used to be uh, ceo at gojek um, so what that does uh, is provide help when needed to our founders in each of these areas mm. and they are not in in their way so it's not uh, as if they are operating with them but every now and then a company may need some support from our head of policy so they'll call in shweta and she's terrific at that or similarly in marketing so that that we believe um, is an important component uh, to be a multi stage investor in india in india okay Sanjeev's is most interesting. Co-founder InfoEdge, uh, founder, executive vice chairman of InfoEdge, including flagship employment website Nokri.com, 
Jeevan Sathi, 99acres, Shiksha.com, also known as the godfather of the Indian startup ecosystem and investment sector. You have kissed it many times. I have kissed it many times. Even not on camera. Now you have to make a picture. It's very appropriate. I think the description is very appropriate. Picture to make a picture. Somebody exaggerated. We just do our work. You can't be that humble. No, no, it is the truth. It is the truth. We just do our work. But yes, what Kunal said was valid. That uh, look, an entrepreneur's journey is very lonely. There's fears, there's apprehension, and there's stuff which only a founder knows. Hmm. Uh, what will happen in the event of failure? See, an employee can walk away from a company. He can resign and go. Typically, a founder goes down the company. And it takes seven to eight years to extricate himself, uh, and he gets branded, right? So founders' fears and, you know, are different, and really only another founder can understand that, because that founder has been through a journey. So if you talk to our portfolio companies, uh, they tell us that listen, we have very different conversation with your team as compared to. Um, a financial investor. Now, we add value. The financial investor adds value. We add different kinds of value. Both are needed, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, we have conversations around operating issues. Yes, sales team. Is what I got to in sales and to plan. Dega, you guys did that. Okay, uh, you want to come into our company, see how we run a call center, mm -hmm. observe it, study it. We'll tell you how to do it. Talk to our analytics team. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to our AI guys. Talk to our technical architects. Because we're doing it, right? Mm. Uh, you know, uh, talk to media bank people. We're doing it. Even the money that you've got, if you raised, talk to our treasury guy to figure out how to park it. Because we do the same thing, right? Uh, but we don't do the kind as rigorous of more, say the financial modeling as a financial investor would do. That's also important. We don't have the kind of networks that, let's say, a peak fifteen will have. In the U.S., in the Bay Area, in you know, we don't have those kind of networks. Mm. Uh, so everybody adds different kinds of value, and uh, really, a founder needs all help, including from uh, founder investors. Sanjeev, it's been what thirty years of you being in this investing ecosystem, in this founding space. Uh, tell me a little a bit about your journey. So, uh, so when I was in my last job, a company called HMM, which is now called GlaxoSmithKline, I was in consumer marketing. I was working on the brand Holix. This was in which year? Eighty-nine, ninety. Ninety. Eighty-nine, ninety, and uh, just out of business school, uh, and we used to sit in an open hall, a junior marketing team, and uh, I was terribly junior, so uh, you know, uh, I used to observe people, and uh, because the open hall, I could see what they were doing and hear what they were saying on the phone. I used to observe that when the office copy of Business India would come in the magazine, uh, everybody would read it from the back, because they, in those days there used to be thirty-five to forty pages of appointment ads in the back. The first thing people will read is the appointment ads. They may not even read the article; they pass on the magazine. And I found this very interesting behavior. I said, "You know, yeah, no magazine ads they can read. They should be reading the articles, and then they will start discussing. There's this job going here. There's this job going there. What do you think? All of that. Very animated conversation will happen. Now these are people who are possibly in the best job they could be in. They're not going to apply. Uh, you know, it was a Decent company, multinational, good brands, paid reasonably well. Uh, so, if you wanted marketing, not sales, which means head office in Delhi, you, you wanted uh, Delhi and not any other city. You wanted MNC and FMCG, right? There are only two companies in Delhi. This is pre-liberalisation. There was Nestle and HMM. And uh, observed behaviour was they would not hire from each other. So, you want the best job you can be in, right? And I found it very strange behaviour. The other thing that I noticed was that because there were eight, ten of us in the same hall, uh, all from the IIMs and well qualified, and you know, working on good brands and company at Holix, Boost, Brill Queen, you know, good brands, right? Uh, this became a good headhunting ground for headhunters, and I could hear the conversation on the phone, and I realized that every week two or three different headhunters would call up, try to headhunt one of the other of my colleagues. Wow! And every week, a different headhunters. Different jobs and these in different companies that these jobs are not advertised in Business India or Times of India, Economic Times anywhere. And that's when I realized that a jobs are a high interest category of information. 
B, there's this hugely, there's big potential here. There's hugely fragmented information about jobs out there with headhunters and with companies which are not addressed. So I said, if somebody can aggregate this database, uh, you know, and put it together and keep it live and current, somehow something useful can be done. Mm. This is 1990. There's you know, there's no internet, there's no LAN even, nothing. So I don't know what to do with the insight. So you know, when you're thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, you get three ideas a day. You know, you do one. After you get a thousand, you do one, right? Uh, so this became one of the file and forget kind of insights. Mm. So in October '96, I had gone to this um, exhibition in Pragati Medan called IT Asia. It was organized by CII. It used to happen every year. And I saw this tiny stall saying WWW. And I said, what is this? So I went to the guy and I said, uh, kya hai? Now, in those. So you had no idea at that time? Nothing. So I said, uh, he said, sir, this is email. Now, basically, um, in those days, VSNL, which is a public sector company then, had a monopoly on uh, internet access in India. Hmm. And email, came bundled with internet access. You, there was no web mail, there was no Gmail, there was no Yahoo mail, there was nothing. Right? Uh, VSNL dot net. Uh, dot in. <laughs> dot net. Uh, <laughs> dot in. Okay, dot in. <laughs> dot, dot, dot net or in. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I said, now I had vaguely heard of email. I didn't know what it was. Uh, you know, and I said, so email. So, I'll give you a demo. So, he... Uh, the two computers, both had modems. I, I mean, what I, I didn't know what they were, but I, he told me they were modems. I never seen a modem before in my life. And you know, so he dialed something, and it ching, ching, all those lights were going to flash, and this noise came. And he said, and I remember thing, modems used to work at that point in time, right? <laughs> okay, and it seems he, like another generation. It was actually another generation. <laughs> <laughs> the guy typed something. Now, in those days, there's no color monitors, there's no TCP IP access, shell account access. It looks like DOS and Unix, you know, uh, mono monitor. Um, and he typed something and says, I have sent email. Now I will log in on the other machine and show I have received the email. Mm. So he logged in on the other machine and he says, see, email has come here. So this is superior to fax, cheaper. Uh, you can talk anywhere, you can say anywhere in the world, it will cost you a few passes. Okay, all of that. He gave me 10 advantages. So, so I said, yeah, but this is going to be a failure. Okay, so I said, why? He said, why? He said, oh, boss. If I have email and I don't know anybody else who has email, hmm. so I don't remember the email. So it's totally useless to me. He's a failure guy. Okay. I, with that verdict, I began to walk away. He's coming up called me back. And he said, uh, sir, this is also internet. So I said, what is internet? Sir, internet is there. Up up near office of bad You can access information. In, Everywhere. From 10, which are stored in hard drives of tens of thousands of computers around the world. Mm. Boss Penny dropped. I said, really? I said, yeah, let's just get uh, jobs from newspapers and magazines and put them in one place on the internet and see. So I asked Boss, how many account is in internet ke in <laughs> India? He said, 14,000. <laughs> I said, sir, shared account is there, shared account, so 2 lakh to do hongi. So it looked like a large number to me, mm. 2 lakhs. Mm. And uh, I said, acha. So I said, boss, I don't want to buy internet access because it's too expensive. But I want to own one of the computers that other people access. Mm. So he said, those are called servers. Mm. So I said, server, I'd never heard of server before. Okay, he said, uh, yes, sir, 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 server America mein hai. To aap kush nahi sakte. I'm sorry to say, and I can't help you. Mm. So I came back home that night, and that night, I rang up my brother, he's a prophet at UCLA. Okay. And uh, I said, listen, have you heard of the internet? So he started laughing. He said, of course, we've got a time. Hmm. I said, you mean an email? He said, yeah, I've got time. I said, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, wow. So, so I said, listen, I want to start a website, a job site, where I'll take jobs from these and magazine, put them up on the internet. So I need a, something called a server. Hmm. Right? So yeah, no problem. I'll get you a server. And I said, I can't pay you because RBI has restrictions. You know, we can't send out foreign exchange. I can't pay on a credit card and all that because your credit card was restricted in India, you couldn't pay overseas with your credit card. So he said, no problem. I'll get you a, a shared server. It'll cost $25 a month. And you work with it and uh, I'll pay, don't worry. For the first will be, I'll, I'll pay for the server. No problem. 
He did that. We had a server. Uh, we had server access. We had a shared server, twenty-five dollars a month. And uh, then I went to a friend, and I, who's a freelance software programmer, very very bright guy. I said, "Do you know how to program for the internet?" He says, "No." I said, "Have you heard of the internet?" He said, "I have." So I said, "Yeah, put up partly. Maybe you can." After I said, "Give me an idea." You know, I'll give you a database in DBase three or XBase or Foxpro, whatever that XBase. Mm. Usko, you have to put on net on the website. So that up, I can do it after one week. So that's a, that. You know, I, I want to just just like um, double down on that um, white spaces, right? You found a white space and you try to start, sort of try to yeah. fill the gap. Yeah, most Kuna, of the time, right? I just stumbled. I just had an idea. Mm. I did it and it worked. But could mm. I comment on that? Mm. How do you because now the situation? So my main aim with this podcast is for that young twenty-year-old, twenty-two-year-old mm. starting afresh, right? Whether mm. it's investing, whether it's uh, becoming a founder, startup. How do you identify that white space? You know, when I started, there were five million internet users in India, and now there are one billion. Seventeen years later, so having seen this arc of the ecosystem develop from literally nobody having smartphones, nobody having smartphone internet, to now everybody having it and everybody being online all the time. And all the companies that have come and gone, the business models that have come and gone, investors that have come and gone, regulations that have come and gone. It's obviously been a rewarding, exhilarating, uh, also challenging uh, experience, but good fun. And you know, the only thing you have to have is a open mind that I want to start something. I'm waiting for an intersection of my desire to start something to intersect with some opportunity that I identify either in my personal life. Or like, for instance, we were talking about Mama Earth, right? Yeah. They they talk about this often, Ghazal and uh, Varun, that their desire to start their business was because they needed toxin-free, you know, shampoos and for their kids. For their kids, right? Um, my desire to start my business was, you know, I uh, I always liked eating food. I still do, and. Um, <laughs> Um, basic needs. <laughs> basic needs. <laughs> and in college, I was doing I was doing three jobs to put myself through college, and the only way I could eat out is by using coupons, right? So when I was, you know, the story is that I was working at Microsoft. They applied for my H one B visa, which got rejected. So I was deported from the U S to India. And when I came back, I was like, I can do a job or start something. And I decided that I would start something. And the first idea that came to my mind was, why don't I start a coupon book business? Mm -hmm. Because that's what I used to use all the time. मेरा भी problem solve हो जाएगा. हाँ, मेरा भी problem solve हो जाएगा. And uh, where you can eat at nice restaurants but pay half the price. And nothing like that existed at the time. Nothing. It was uh, clearly very, very, very ahead of its time. <laughs> but, but you know, you you find if if you yourself resonate with the idea, it is every business. Any business, I'm sure Sanjeev, Vishan can also uh, comment about that. But any business goes through its twists and turns. Mm. Generally, whenever you start, there is some amount of beginner's luck you see, and you feel ये तो अब चल गया, अब तो billionaire हो गए हम, right? And and then suddenly it falls off a cliff. Then you realize, फट गई. Why? Why does that happen? Tell me. How does it? Is it because you are, you know, um, I was having this uh, conversation with Anupam Mittal when he was telling me about his investment in mm. Ola. Mm. and how he had he felt that there was not enough access to transport when he was in delhi you know you can't just pick up the phone or get a cab whenever you want but then as you sort of move away from uh, the uh, the customer as you you know you start traveling in your own car you have your, you become a little disconnected from the customer right you know the difference between an idea and a business is that you solve the problems yeah. right so many people have great ideas but very few people actually have good businesses The reason is they have not solved the innumerable problems that lie between the idea and the business getting created, and what at least I've seen as a builder as well as a, as an investor is that great companies are actually created at the intersection of what is contrarian but also factually correct at that time. Mm. So let's take Ola's example. Like we were their first seed investor. Um, what was contrarian was the fact that in making that bet was that if you needed a taxi, you could get a taxi, mm. right? You could send domestic help to a nearby taxi stand or walk to a taxi stand, and you will get a taxi. It's not like people had to go to the airport in a rickshaw. Mm. So, however, what was also factually correct that it was incredibly inconvenient to do so, and invariably at the end of the taxi ride there was a negotiation, mm. which was also very unsavory. So. 
and you can take this example again and again uh, across companies, right? You take Mama Earth, we were talking about Mama Earth, right? What was contrarian was the fact that there were already a lot of incumbent existing brands like Johnson & Johnson, etc., mm. which everyone was using, mm. but was also factually correct at the same time, there was no toxin-free option. Correct. With greater awareness amongst young parents, there was no toxin-free option in the market, which was credible. So you can look at any of the companies that got created. Urban Company, another example, yeah. right? Um, when we invested in them at their seed stage, we realized, you know, a lot of people told us that this will not because how do you organize the, uh, this blue-collar market where mm -hmm. there's unreliability and, and so on and so forth. So that was the contrarian part. Mm -hmm. But what was also factually correct at the same time is that whenever you had, you got some local plumber, electrician, First, they would not show up on time. Secondly, they would usually be unskilled mm -hmm. or not as skilled as they needed to be. And thirdly, Negotiate invariably, a lot. it'll end up with a negotiation. Yeah. right? Which we, everyone wants to avoid. Exactly. So we've seen over and over again that the best investments, best ideas, best businesses start at the intersection of being sort of contrarian bets, but also rooted in some facts which were real. Hmm. Ishan, you're coming on that because you guys are investors in Mama Earth as well and uh, continue to be so. Um, where do you think the, uh, you know, the zero to one stage, right? To move from the zero to one stage, where do you think the challenge lies? I think Kunal said it quite well. Uh, the challenge lies in two parts. One is identifying the white space, the, the unsolved customer problem. Mm -hmm. Now, many people get there, but then the second part is also executing on it, right? So, just getting all the key ingredients that are required, whether that be the right product that solves that problem, getting the right team that then distributes it, gets it to the customers. These, in hindsight, once we see the companies having built and gone public, sounds quite normal, quite obvious, uh, but it's absolutely not trivial. Um, and, and for that reason, what it really takes to build these uh, fantastic companies is this the set of founders who are very passionate about that problem statement mm. because you asked, right, why does it It goes up and comes down. Every company goes through it. There is no linearly nice, smooth journey. Mm. And that tough day when it comes, what gets you past that cliff is really that passion. Mm. That, uh, that desire to solve that problem, get past it, build it. I'm sure Sanjeev went through a bunch of these in their journey, right? But... Uh, but that really, that passion in our mind, really, we call it, some people call it missionary founders, uh, some we call it authentic uh, founders, but that's really what it takes to get there. It's very basic, right? I mean, uh, Sanjeev was saying that people had a job and they were looking for jobs, so you know, that's the idea of Nafi.com. They were looking at ad jobs, they would not apply, but they were interested because people are interested in benchmarking, they were looking at, am I doing well enough, what's happening, am I, you know, no, no, but I'll tell you just to take on, uh, carry on from what uh, Kunal said. See, what we have always said internally is successful businesses are often based on deep customer insights. What was my customer insight? That jobs are, aggregation of jobs will create value because people are interested in knowing about jobs. Mm. I have observed that behavior. It's a customer, it's a consumer observation, right? Uh, how did the idea of Zomato come to Dipinder? I met him the first time in June 2010. One of the first questions I asked him was, Dipinder, the idea has had. Now, what was the idea? There were other restaurant listing sites, but Zomato was then called Food eBay. It was the only one with all the menu cards. Mm. And that was the differentiator. It was an encyclopedic compilation of all menu cards and restaurants. Mm. Okay. Others had the restaurant and then reviews and then photographs. It was menu card. So, and I used to use the site and find it very useful. Hitesh used to use it find it very useful because we wanted to see the menu cards. And we would simply not go to any other site. Yes, yeah, the menu card. Mm -hmm. Now, menu card, you can check kya dish, kya price, you know, you can plan your meal before you leave the house. All of us do that now. Okay. <laughs> Up to order in Ogaya, but. Next but, level, uh -huh. But. So I say, idea kaise hai? So he says, I was working in Bain Consulting after IIT, and Bain had a cafeteria that would not serve food, but it would bring your own food and eat it. Pachasat log the, mostly male, mostly single, many living away from home. 
what it meant was they won't get lunch from home. Mm. Consulting hours are long, so invariably they're having lunch and dinner both in the office. So to make life easy for the people in, in the company, in the office, the admin team had compiled, collected the menu cards, the mm. delivery menu cards of roughly 70 or 80 restaurants that will deliver to that location and put it in a very file folder. And they the say, you know, I've got deadlines to meet, I'm overworked, my boss is on my head, you know, and I have to go down to the, I have to go to the cafeteria, I have to wait in line to access the file. It's only one file. It's a shared resource. And then I get for 30 seconds and then I decide, you know, what to order. Then I call up the restaurant, I order, then I go to back to back to my desk, work, do some more work, then come back at 40 minutes, pay and then eat. Very inconvenient. So this is one weekend I came in and I scanned all these menu cards. Right? And put them up on my personal page on the office internet. Mm. Just three days later, the IT infra guy came to me and said, Man, what have you done? Why is 95% of internal traffic going to your page? And so then he dropped. This is that epiphany, Eureka moment, boss, aggregation of menu cards has got value. Mm. Just as like, I had discovered, you know, a decade or more ago, mm. that aggregation of jobs has got value. So the important thing in this is convenience for customers. Customer, customer insight. Are you solving an unsolved problem? Hmm. And generally what happens is you start with that one insight which gives you an entry into a market. That may not be the eventual business, but you need a starting point. Hmm. right? That starting point may not necessarily be the most viable business, but you need something to start with. Hmm. Like Getting from zero to one is so critical because you can't, you know, the confidence builds with action. It actually shrinks with idleness. Mm. If you start doing something, okay, you have this insight about menu card scanning. Start to, like put it on the intranet. And keep doing. Keep you know, doing. Like keep to working towards. And then soon you'll figure out, okay, this is a good business, good traction, but monetization is challenging. Okay, how do we monetize now? Mm. Let's add some more services or products on top of it. Mm. So that's how, you know, from one thing to the next, you have to, you can't stay stagnant also. Just because you found one good insight, Correct. that is a good for a starting point, but you have to keep going from there also. Correct. But you know, Snapdeal was started at a time when there was no market for e-commerce, right? Yeah, correct. But so now, actually our, it, there is a market for everything. Correct, correct. So, uh, I mean, maybe taking a cue from what Sanjeev said, we started as a physical coupon book magazine. No internet, no website, nothing, right? You sold the coupon book for four ninety nine. you tear the coupon, get a discount at a restaurant. And then as internet started taking off, a lot of our merchants started telling us that, why don't you put these coupons online? Because easier, more people can access. So in 2010, we launched Snapdeal. It was called Money Saver before that, mm. right? Uh, completely un uncreative name. <laughs> and... Um, and then we realized that once these coupons started taking off, that why are we limiting our supply or things we are selling only to these vouchers of spa salons and restaurants? Why not also sell physical products? Mm. Because the same customer is also a customer of a phone and you know washing machines and sunglasses. So I think as a founder, you have to just keep, keep moving. You can't just say, okay, now I found one thing that works, let me just stick with it. You have to keep moving, keep challenging, keep pushing the boundaries. Mm. Okay, so now I've realized one thing that everyone's looking for the next big idea, right? The next generation, what do you think it is that they need where there could be a couple of big business ideas that one can churn out? Yeah, I mean, uh, so look, the, the fundamental principles have not changed. You need to solve an unsolved problem for somebody who's willing to pay to have that problem solved, mm. right? If the problem has already been solved, then you have to sell. If, you, if you're solving an unsolved problem, the customer will buy it without you having to sell. Mm. Uh, we got traffic in 97 on a very low uh, internet user base. And we got repeat traffic simply because people kept coming back because people said, yeah, it's my job date now. Now, whether or not I'm looking for a job, I look at a job. Mm. Some were looking for jobs, they used to apply. So our promise, you know, so, so basically you need a, some sort of delivery on a promise that will attract the customer. Mm. So policy bazaar. So I met Yashish and he said, I'm willing to bet you're paying 60% more for your car insurance than you need to. I said, don't be daft. You know, I bought the insurance, I bought the car from a dealer 
ट्रस्टेड डीलर पब्लिक सेक्टर कंपनी का इंश्योरेंस है नेशनल इंश्योरेंस कंपनी ऑल ऑफ दैट ई सेट नो शो मी योर पॉलिसी टू गॉट माई पॉलिसी गेव इट टू मैं इस बिगारी में बैक पैक लाइंग मी गेव इट टू ओके फाइन एंड ही क्वेरीड समथिंग एंड मेड नंबर फोन कॉल्स एंड ही केम बैक विद इन हाफ एन आवर विथ सिक्स कोर्ट्स फॉर द सेम माई कार माई ईयर माई मॉडल my number of kilometers all that you know driver driven all that and sure enough the lowest quote was 40% lower than what i was paying i said what is this this is that exactly it the so why was there such a big difference say different companies price the same risk differently they will assess the risk differently hmm alag alag model hote hain and there isn't transparency comparison and this thing now that insight he had right as a man this will work so we invested even before there was a power point not even a power point okay just like zomato you know he had that insight that in nokri he had that so you need a very good sharp focused customer insight mm-hmm. ki agar main ye karu to customer will want it and will, will buy it mm-hmm. uh i won't have to sell very hard moment you sell hard it becomes a challenge you know you climbing up it so that customer insight is what i want to understand because you guys have also been uh, investors in big businesses right i mm. mean you've done 100x in what uh, there's ola there's mama there's urban company mm. what what next what's the next big thing so i think i often get asked this question that um uh what are what are some of the areas that will become big mm. right and i actually um answer that by saying what will not become big everything will become big right we are on this ride in india right now where from 91 to now in 30 odd years we've added 3 trillion in our gdp mm-hmm. we're adding 3 trillion in the next 7 years so everything will become big the question is are you have you like sanjeev rightly said the right customer insight the right market opportunity are you building with with focus and discipline or not are you able to hire or not it's actually now in india we are no longer fighting the battle of ye market kab aayega market aa gaya hai we are the only large gdp in the world that's going to add large country in the world that's going to add almost half a trillion of gdp every year henceforth mm. a bunch of that is going to trickle to the startups only so But what is the problem that has not been solved yet because to me it seems like every problem now has been solved every space that is the job failed. of the founders right <laughs> <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly it now see we meet about a thousand startups a quarter we, well we meet we study we whatever secondary primary jo bhi hai and we invest in three or four right we know that we can't be limited by our own imagination mm. right i would never have thought of a restaurant listing site i would never have thought of insurance comparison site you have, so we are in the business of harnessing and riding on the imagination and the insights of a thousand other people 10000 other people correct okay? correct so mere ko idea nahi sochna hai mere ko unka idea assess karna hai hmm so you know when you ask me what problem i don't know yaar somebody will figure it out but we, at the we, same time we, as an investor it is important to focus on your circle of competence hmm. because just because there is opportunity everywhere as an investor you have to be and also founders have to be very clear they're going to investors to ask for money whether investor also has a circle of competence or has competence in the circle that they are operating in Correct. right because otherwise there is always a hot new wave mm-hmm. right there was an you know e-commerce wave ride hailing wave fintech wave edtech wave crypto wave ai wave right there is a wave always there is a wave And, and now these waves are coming like every few months rather than every few years earlier. and that will be the case that will be perpetual right for sure however as an investor it is very important to focus on your circle of competence and more importantly for founders to find investors whose competence lies in their circle hmm. otherwise it's very easy to catch these wave riding investors who are you know literally fair weather friends where the moment the wave turns they'll be like oh founder was not good the market collapse the regulation change they'll come up with excuses to justify why the investment didn't work mm. but you want people investor as founders you want investors who will be with you for the long run mm. because they have deep conviction in the space obviously deep conviction in the people who are building that business and are willing to ride the ups and downs that will invariably come mm. in building of any kind of company 
however promising the market will be. So, yeah. So what are the qualities that you would look for when you are investing in a business, in a successful business? So let me let me just uh, complete the previous point and add one thing. What you said was very interesting, which is where you said that all the problems are solved. So what is the next thing? I'll tell you one funny thing. Every time a founder comes with a new business idea and insight, most of us actually think that that problem is solved. Mm. And then the founders think of this unsolved problem with the customer is also not fully articulating. Like Sanjeev said, he was not articulating that I have a problem with my insurance policy. Yashish came up with an idea and made him realize I can give you a better answer. Any we examples? Uh, Sanjeev gave us Policy Bazaar, anything else? Many of them. I'll give you one example. When, Ra when we invested in RazorPay in 2019, mm -hmm. by that time, payments ecosystem was well solved for. Nobody was coming and saying, oh, I can't buy my products. Flipkart was built, Ecom was built, Ola was built, and so was Uber. But RazorPay came with a significant upgrade in terms of pr product. The UPI wave was just starting. So there was a form factor change that was coming from credit card or debit card, you're coming into UPI. They changed the product. And at that point in time, they, they saw market share gains like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, I don't think anybody was saying my e-commerce problems are not fully solved, right? But in the last two years, we have seen what has happened with quick commerce. I don't think anybody was going and putting it on social media saying, why am I getting my products in one day? I would like to get them in 10 days okay. or 10 minutes, right? Okay. But somebody thought of it. And now we have Blinkit, Zepto, Instamart going after it. And consumers are loving it, right? Similarly, you go further in payments today, we are we investors in a couple of uh, cross-border payments companies because we are now seeing that India is going from just being a domestic market to a market which is seeing a lot more cross-border trade, whether import or export. What it comes down to, Sonia, in our experience, is that businesses need a very clean why now. Yeah. Sometimes that why now happens because there's a platform shift. A mobile platform comes and there's a why now. That's for the first. Why could you have an Ola Uber? You could have an Ola Uber because the mobile platform came. You could have the same idea five years ago, but if the consumer on the street does not have a mobile phone, they can't really hail a cab. Mm. Right? Every few years, there's a new why now that comes. Sometimes that's a new technology. Sometimes that's a, a further deepening of a certain sub-segment in the market. And sometimes it's just generational shift. Mm. What we are okay with sometimes, the next generation actually is not okay with it. Mm. And that's what provides that initial opening, initial wedge for the founders to build for the consumers and then just go through with that in the market. It's interesting you brought up this point on Zepto, Blinkit and all of that. Like quick commerce is picking up. I mean, in the last one year, I think the and rise recall, has been phenomenal. And do you recall like, just a year, year and a half back how much criticism there was? Like, what is the stupidity? Yeah. Yeah. Why are people launching it? Uh, you know, it's going to fail. Yeah. Uh, will people want I'd rather want it? wait. I don't want my uh, pizza yeah. to come in like 10 minutes. It's okay. You relax. Not just pizza, my sabun, my tail. You yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, people used to say that about e-commerce also. I remember when we started the, this is now 12 years, 13 years ago. Um, uh, people used to say Indians will not buy online. They don't trust, you know, remote people. They want to touch and feel, deal with, who the, deal with the person that they can see. Then mobile phones started selling. They're like, okay, fine, mobile phones they will buy because it comes in a box, it's a Samsung or whatever, it's standard product, standard price. They'll never buy fashion, right? And then people started buying clothes. They're like, okay, maybe they're buying clothes because they can get them fixed from a lo local tailor. They'll never buy makeup. <laughs> they'll never buy shoes, right? Because shoes, everyone's shoes. You got to try it on. <laughs> you have to try it on. Okay, then, then they started buying shoes. Then they said, they'll never buy makeup. Makeup, no chance. Yeah. Right, so and rest is history. I think we... We, we always underestimate how much consumers are willing to change. Also, I think on the point of finding a wedge, what Ishan was saying, oftentimes in founders feel that they need to go to investors with the largest possible TAM. That I need to show up with this like $10 billion TAM, only then some investor will actually invest. Mm. Actually, what our view is diametrically opposite from that. Mm. Right At Titan, what we look for is what we call laughably small TAMs. Really? I didn't know so that. So when a founder... But why is that? Because when you have, when you're just starting, you have three people, mostly just co-founders and interns, and you're going to raise three to five crores in your pre-seed round. Your first round will be that much only. The only segment of the market you can dominate realistically is a laughably small segment of the market. Mm. Because with the amount of money and resources you have, you really can't make much more of a dent. Mm. So, you know, even we don't look at them. Okay, and I'll uh, tell you why. When you're investing behind category creating entrepreneurs, the category does not exist. He has to create the market. He has to create the time, he or she. Mm. So I, I'll tell you a little story. So 
we launched in 97. Uh, we bootstrapped for three years and we went to raise money around early 2000 mm. in Salbad. We, I didn't hire a lawyer. I didn't hire a banker. I thought I was smart. Okay. Uh, you know, from I am the I've done legal aspects of the course. I know it all. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so That's I, a separate conversation <laughs> we need to have. <laughs> okay. Just so stupid of me. Just trying to save money. Okay. Which I should not be trying to save. Uh, and I went and talked to four investors. Bubble time, I got three term sheets. Okay. The fourth guy, and I won't name the fund. The fourth guy. Please do. Don't. Both do. Abhi sab bethe hai idhar. Look, people. Even I have. You listen to my anti portfolio. It'll be. You'll be amazed. But I'll. We can discuss that later on today. Uh, so this guy says to me, you know what is the total size of the print advertising market in India in appointment ads? So I said, Hoga, four hundred, five hundred crore. I don't know what it is, but it's not my opinion that it's going to happen. Now, what is the price difference between an appointment at Times of India Ascent and a listing on Nokri? I said, one is to 10,000. One is to 1,000. I don't know. He said, then to boss, you will shrink the market to 40 lakhs if uh, you succeed and get 100% market share. So, the entire market is 40 lakhs. How, how, how can I invest in you? Out. You're a good salesman. You're a great guy. I like the, your passion, but boss, I mean, it's a 40 lakh market. That's it. Hmm. So I can't invest. Then no. So, and look where Nokri is gone. So, you know, hmm. we don't look at time here. So I'll tell you, when we wrote our business plan, uh, you know, the, that time, uh, to, to, to go to these investors, uh, we were doing 3 lakhs a month of sales, and I had projected that we will do 1 crore a month of sales, say, 4 years out. Mm. That was the limit of our imagination, our assessment. Okay. Four years out, so that's 12 crores a year. Four years mm. out, we did 84 crores. Mm. We were wrong by 7x because we are creating a new category, a new market. Mm. And the market responded well, internet penetrated. We were solving unsolved problems. Uh, you know, we put a sales force out in the market, they made the revenue happen. Mm. Right? So when you're creating a new category, uh, we don't look at time. Okay, so you don't look at time. That's one. We don't look at time. We don't okay. say, yeah, we. Because if a market already exists, let mm. me assure you, you're not investing behind first mover. Okay. You're not investing behind a guy who's solving unsolved problems. And there'll already be very large existing players with a lot more resources and scale mm. who will eat up the upstart for lunch. And what is the best way to approach it now? Is it better to be a bootstrap founder to, you know, for the first few years rather than sort of raise money? at a fast pace. I mean, how do you approach it? Because all of you here are investing in a lot of new age businesses as well. So someone like me who's maybe perhaps at some point looking to start my own business, how should I approach it? See, it's really a personal choice. And also it, it has two things. One personal choice, second nature of opportunity that you're pursuing. Sometimes people don't want to raise external money and that's a very deeply rooted philosophical view they have. And then they build their business that way. However, there are always some business models, business ideas that can't be started and taken from zero to one without having some amount of capital. What's the success ratio between bootstrap founders and money raising in the zero to one phase? It's hard to say. We have not done a quantification. Yeah, but it's hard to say. Who are going, but we don't uh, know. There will be <laughs> enough examples in both. Uh, but I think that's in the end, uh, let's, let's take the case of the zero to one that is being done with external money. Mm. Just because you raise external money to get from zero to one doesn't mean you have to get on this hamster wheel of raising money every two years, mm. which seems to have gotten codified as a way of building businesses in our ecosystem. Mm. That once I'm on this journey pre-seed, then uske baad do saal baad uh, series A, then two saal baad series B, it doesn't have the businesses don't have to be built like that. Mm. And generally, founders get on this hamster wheel because there is an urgency, an impatience. You fat of paise raise karo, fat of paise growth burn karo, fat of grow karo, fir aur paise raise karo. It's a never ending cycle. Mm. We actually encourage companies, we invest in that, having learned from our own experiences also, that uh, raise as less as possible, get to profitability as quickly as possible, and then you're in full control of your destiny. 
Mm. You know, these per- multiple fundraisers will give you pleasure. Mm. But when you become profitable, that is what will give you happiness. Okay. Right? <laughs> At the end of the day, it all boils down to profit. Yeah, then you are in absolute control of your destiny. So, you know how much money Nokri raised in its life before IPO? No. 7.3 crores. One round. Uh, and you know how much money we used off the 7.5 Five crores. Okay? Great companies are capital efficient. Mm. So, basically, young founders, they don't have money for money. Hmm. Maybe you need more money for your business, maybe you need less money, but you have to pay pay. Correct, correct. Okay, so we've, uh, we've figured out a few things. Why now? We need to answer that question. Don't necessarily look at TAM uh, and raise as less money as possible. You can also grow your business. Any other uh, contributions on how one can sort of start their own business and what are the requirements? Because today it's very different from what it was 10 years ago, right? The ecosystem has evolved a lot. Yeah, it, it is very different and for that reason, uh, while we also firmly believe in getting to profitability, sometimes, I think the only thing I would add is sometimes competitive dynamics of a certain industry uh, may lead to slightly different answer because if you are in a more winner-take-all type market and your competitor is behaving very differently than what you are, I then you then you will have to, for being the winner, for being the survivor, burn the capital. What is really important is what Sanjeev said. While doing that, you still can be more efficient than your competitor in using that money. You can be more careful, more prudent. Any examples? Um, there are many examples. Like uh-huh. look at look, look at Zomato today. Zomato, uh, Zomato raised a lot of money by the way. Uh, yeah. Okay. But that's because competitor raising money. Exactly to this point. By the way, Sequoia and Astro co-investors. Mm. Uh, in Zomato. Uh, and uh, at each stage, uh, you know, he, he wasn't wasting money. He was using it well. Yeah. I mean, in our own business, I have two, like an A-B test almost, where Snapdeal, highly competitive market, like unit economics were very challenged for e-commerce because the market was not there. Raise a lot of money, spend a lot of money, right? Then our software business, Unicommerce, raised zero primary capital, right? And now is obviously on the precipice of going public. So I think different markets, I agree with Ishan, different markets... It doesn't mean that the founder is has some obsession with raising and burning money. Yeah. Sometimes you just, different markets require different approaches. But investors generally have a preference, right? I We very clearly have a preference for backing business models that will not consume a lot of cash. We'll get to profitability sooner. That means we'll say no to some businesses that will become very large. But on that path, we'll need to burn a lot of money because they are unit economics challenge for a long time. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, you know, we were talking about journeys, right? And uh, he was tell- Sanjeev was telling us about his. Uh, Kunal, how did you start? What was your story? How did you get into this? And what has your biggest learning been through it all? You know, I think um, there is always opportunity in every segment. As I said earlier, the key is to uh, not get carried away by the uh, big consulting reports about which segment is going to... There was one that came out this week. Really nice, pretty report. But... When I was looking at it, I was like, you know, but this doesn't tell me what should I do next, (laughs) right? Um, In in terms of what should I really invest in, everything is growing, which is which is fantastic about Mm -hmm. India. However, um, you know, uh, just in the end, the three things that matter, as we've seen uh, in uh, identifying companies to invest in, one quality of the team, Mm -hmm. right? So because it's not just the business idea itself, there it it is a multi variable decision. The business idea itself uh, is one very important part of it, Um, but we'll come to that. The first is a team. It has to be a team that has demonstrated some amount of success in the past. Mm. It could be professional, personal life, like dancing, singing, acting, whatever. Because to be successful in anything, anything, you need a level of intensity and grit, which will, you know, serve you well in your entrepreneurial journey. Mm. The second is what we discussed about having that narrow focus, a focus approach on a narrow market and saying, I will now only do this and then earn the right to expand my TAM thereafter. Mm. And the third is the unit economics. Many times founders will come to us and say, today I'm a 20% gross margin business, but with economies of scale, which is, you know, big MBA word, uh, in the economies <laughs> of scale, we'll become 60% gross margin business. I tell them, oh, ho jayega. you will not be in the same business though. Mm. The, you can't be 
go from 20% margin business to 60% margin business and yet be in the same business. Mm. Because margin defines the soul of the business. The soul would have changed. Correct. right? All your day-to-day -day decisions would have changed if you have to get there. Correct. And hence defining are you a squirrel with a tail or elephant with a trunk. right? Very early on you have to decide that. It's like setting the trajectory of a rocket. Mm. So, so I think it's really all. So if you have a twenty percent margin gross margin business, you're saying that don't aim for you know just. It's keep not it going to change, okay, right? Yeah. It it may be perfectly okay to have a twenty percent margin. Twenty percent है आज आज और कल start करना है. Either your your price has to go up that much, hmm. or your product has to change, hmm. or your cost has to dramatically decline, right? Which is why you say it'll be the same business. Hmm. And there's nothing wrong with the twenty percent. They're perfectly. Healthy, good, growing, profitable, 20% gross margin businesses. But don't make your assumptions on how this business will play out by making this very large assumption that this 20% will become 60% and that's when it will become viable. Hmm. That's not going to happen. Okay. It's never happened before. right? Um, so, it, uh, so in summary, obviously, there's focus on that one problem statement and then along with that, it's the right team, unit economics. And the ability to find that narrow wedge in the market is very critical. Uh, you know, it was it stemmed from this desire of, um, you know, being in control of my destiny, right? Like I think I always had issues with authority, so I wanted to always do something where I was the boss, mm. and that's where it really started from. It started from coupon books, went to e-commerce, went to software. Are you in control of your destiny now? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. At least I believe so. <laughs> that's what matters. But I think along with that journey was also the desire to give back to the ecosystem. You know, Rohit and I, my co-founder and I, we started with 30 lakh rupees, which was the one year of savings the two of us had from doing one year of jobs at Microsoft and Capital One respectively. And through many, many near-death experiences, I think at least seven, eight times we've just shut down, literally just weeks away from two weeks, four weeks from shutdown. Um, and... And I think having come out of that every time, mm. and like Ishan was earlier saying, it is when you're at that bottom of the abyss, mm. finding that little bit of courage to continue is what that mat what matters. Mm. And 95% of people give up at that bottom of the abyss saying, mm. now whoever I talk to, whoever I ask for advice, nothing is working. Nothing is helping. There is nothing anyone can say to me, advise me, that can get me out of this rut. And at that moment where it seems unredeemable, if you can find that little bit of courage to move up, very quickly you see you're out of the hole. So what does it take to get out of that hole? Because it's not easy, right? For a lot of people, they give up. And you're saying you went through it several times. Yeah, and most founders go through it several times. From the outside, we think that the trend line is, yaan se shuru wa or yaan. Hmm. it's like this. Hmm. It's actually zigzag, up, down. Like It's all kinds of trajectories interspersed in that point A to point B. You know, I think it is this uh, deep-rooted desire that failure is not an option, right? Maybe it's a manufacturing defect. I don't know, but but there will. Does it stem from your childhood? I don't. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, no, you're, this is becoming Freudian. Uh, but uh, no, but, because I've heard a lot of people say that it, a lot of their journey also stems from the fact that you know. A lot of us have been uh, from come up from very middle class backgrounds where our parents struggled with money, where there was not too much money in the house to do a lot of things that we want. So there is this desperation for success also. Is that something? Yeah, I think there is. The, if we never, like Rohit and I never thought that uh, like shutting this down and going and looking for a job was ever an option. Okay, mm -hmm. no problem. Change it. Mm -hmm. Right? We are not that we had a certain idea, didn't work. Let's not get upset about it. Mm. Let's change it. Let's find another idea. Mm. But let's just keep going. Right? Like, I don't think we've ever, ever in 17 years of entrepreneurship, ever, even for a moment, imagined this will be closed. But this will be a business model. It will be a company. But at what point do you realize that okay, a business model is, is dead? It's, it's done. I mean, you try for a couple of times and then you feel that okay, it's not working out. At yeah. what point does that happen? I feel that if the unit economics can't improve in a business, like the unit economics of the business, which is basically your margin minus all variable expenses, mm. if those are not improving despite everything you are doing, mm. eventually that business is going to shut down. You can only delay the problem, but it will shut down. So for how long? How long do you... Because when you start a business, obviously profitability but takes a lot of time. You know, the market, Sonia, is so much deeper now that if you're not getting that within months or a few quarters, it is not going to work. Mm. 
right? And at least that's the exacting standard we put ourselves through and all the companies we invest in through. If you have not reached a point in a month or three quarters, unit economics positive. Actually, we don't invest in it. But we have done it, invest. And the unit economics is negative. If it's not back positive, in short order, then we are very worried. We generally sit down with the, uh, with the entrepreneur, ask why this is happening. Do we need to readjust the margins, readjust the pricing, readjust the cost structure mm. and get it back to unit economics positive or change the business model? Mm. That's also a viable option. But there are so but many times see, when, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, see, ideally, Sonia, your customers tell it to you. Mm. Right? As he said, it's a deep market. Uh, we call it, can you hear the sucking sound? When you switch on your vacuum cleaner, you know, the way dirt goes and you can hear that sound. At some point, you've iterated with your product, your pricing, you've found your customer. You should, as a founder, be able to hear that sucking sound. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be very large. You don't need to be hearing it at 100 million scale. You could hear it at 1 million scale, at $100,000 scale. But the product should be selling. There should be a pull for it. If you continue to just feel that I'm having to push it, mm -hmm. then something needs to be changed. What change? It could be the product change. It could be pricing change. It could be customer segment change. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're selling to the wrong customer. Mm -hmm. But very soon you should be able to hear that sucking sound. But you know, if you just come back to the Zomato example, right? For the longest time, Zomato was not making, I mean, forget about profitability. For the longest time, they were not doing well, but the model was good. Yes. It took time to scale up. It took time to pick up, right? No, no, one second. Zomato was a restaurant listing site, not a food delivery site. Mm. It launched food delivery only in 2018. We had invested in 2010. Mm. They launched, Zomato was launched in 2010. They did not do food delivery, mm. right? They were a restaurant listing site. They used to get revenue from restaurants and allied services and products that wanted to advertise. And okay, and they were not burning a lot of money. Okay, then they said we'll expand overseas because the Indian market you may not get that much growth. So they went London, Portugal, US, Australia, you know, Dubai, everywhere. That burnt money because they were launching these markets and losing money there. But India was not. It was not that expensive. It was losing very little money. They began to burn serious cash for three or four years when they began food delivery. So they were making money on every order. But it, this is a network business. You, you've got to have four lakh riders. You've got to cover 500 cities. You've got to have four lakh restaurants. And when people begin to order and you're delivering so many orders, that's when you actually make money. So that took four years. So there was always a plan. I mean, let's take a look at Blinkit, right? So I chair the Zomato Investment Committee mm -hmm. on the board, okay? And this thing came to the Investment Committee that we want to buy Blinkit. And I said, yeah, what do you Your stock is in trouble in the public market. They are now listed. Uh, you're burning cash. Mm. You have you have to get to profit within two, three, four years. Uh, two, three years because the market will not permit a loss-making company. They will bat, they will hammer your price down. Which happened for a while. Yeah, yeah, it happened. Now, but that is more linked to global factors. Okay, I mean, the, not, not the company fundamentals. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, what you don't want is ki ye turn around and you have lost, you got you got two billion dollars mm. and so you can, you will not go under, but you, you can't have two big holes. Mm. Mm. Okay? So are you sure? So Dipinda said, you know, I have studied it. I know we can turn it around, blink it, and the order getting the profit, take it from me. And then finally he said, listen, just trust me. Mm. So I sort of we sort of took a leap of faith. We trusted him. And sure enough, Zamato was turned around, the food delivery. And blink it is almost there. And you you can see with the stock prices. The market is now understood. Although although so there was a lot of criticism when they did such a large acquisition uh, of growers. I remember they that. It, and uh, the media was after them, analysts were after them. So to a certain extent, it's a leap of faith that you have to take in the trust uh, on no, the... No, no, no. Uh, he knew something which the market could not see. Mm. Right? He knew he could turn around. He knew the market was turning around. Right? And I'm more cautious. I say, wait and see, wait and see. Mm. So my initial reaction was, yeah, ye, are you sure you want to take two big risks at the same time? To have two big loss making at the same time. Mm. Right? So it's okay. The motto is heading this way. Blink it, I'll make head that way. You know, there's an interesting saying, a young man knows the rules and experienced man knows the exceptions. Mm -hmm. The founders are so experienced in their businesses 
they know what is the exception to the rules mm. like in this case what sanjeev was mentioning they they understand that okay this which is let's say minus 5% unit economics i know here are the 10 things i need to do each thing will be 1 rupee 2 rupees 3 rupees 5 rupees and i'll be able to turn it and most people will not have that depth of right. understanding Insight. of what is going on inside the business mm. and that is in some ways an exception to the rule because maybe outsiders have never seen that happen in Correct. a business like ours uh, or uh, or like theirs Correct. so i think you have to have that conviction as a founder that i know it will be done and i know how it will be done mm. obviously there is no guarantee but that's how you build conviction yeah and you have to have that leap of faith as an investor too i mean frankly speaking you have discussed making 10 times your returns 100 times your returns if you if you truly want to make that much alpha mm-hmm. which we, we all believe you would like to and founders will and investors will it cannot be without risk mm-hmm. it cannot be without belief you have to take that belief that leap of faith while backing a founder you believe in that he or she i believe can do this mm-hmm. so and sometimes you cannot put it on paper yeah. alpha comes when you see something the others don't and you're right But that's a big gamble, right? I mean, investing in uh, it's so. So here's what we say internally, especially right? early stage investing. Here's what we so here's what we say. We say many things, right? In our investing team, but one or two of the things that we like tell the team is the secret of successful early stage investing is to invest behind founders and companies who are going to succeed anyway, right? And you tag along. They're not succeeding because of you. Hmm. If we had not invested in Zavato, somebody else might have. They would. Come, that team would have succeeded anyway how do you have that conviction though so we look for two things i mean look for 50 things but two of them are <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 only two no not possible <laughs> but, but but two of the first things are is this thing showing natural traction natural traction means ki download ho raha hai usage hai traffic aa raha hai without ad time hmm. and is growing right so when we invested in zomato we were the first people to invest and uh, it was getting traffic and at that time there was no app uh, and the traffic was growing mm. yeah there's something here they seem to hit a hot button mm. growth no yeah. natural traction mm, natural. Na- natural no revenue they were one lakh a month of revenue that time uh, or the value prop is so plainly obvious like like policy bazaar right that we went in pre power point mm. it's so obvious eh? You know, customer will want this. So some customer, basically, you are trying to predict or identify. Will it go? How will the customer want this? Just yeah. yeah. on the natural traction point, I'm very interested. It just reminds me of a story about uh, uh, Mama Earth. You know how we discovered Mama Earth was? I went into my daughter's uh, shower and I saw these green and white bottles sitting there. Mm. I was like, "Ye kya hai?" The name ni suna tha maine. And because everyone knew all the big names at that point in time, so I asked my wife. What, where did you buy this how did you find this mm. she said i was looking for a toxin free or organic uh, baby shampoo and i just posted on some moms group on uh, on facebook and within about 30 minutes 20 moms responded 18 of them said mama mm. for a, and at that point in time they were doing 7 lakhs of monthly revenue okay right now they do whatever 200 crores or whatever the number is so and i remember i turned the bottle picked up the phone there was a number written there i called uh like fir to cheez to sahi hai right puchna chahiye kya hai and then i uh, the number that i called at the back of the bottle um, was picked up by varun and okay. and he used to sit in interactive avenues which is their which was their digital agency's office right and i was like i asked ki kitne logon ki company which i think there were five or seven of them for a 5 7 person company if already without spending any money the product is bringing in so many customers that they are becoming such recommenders correct something's working so let me tell you my experience because i had a child around the same time you know when they yeah, started exactly. and yeah, i went through the same thing so what happens is when your child is born you it doesn't come with any manual Mm. There's no way to tell you. <laughs> Unfortunately, right. <laughs> everything has a manual in life except when you have a child. And okay. suddenly, th- there is this thing right in front of you, and you have to bathe it and feed it, and nobody it. tells you. Yeah. <laughs> Because like a mm. mini mini project of sorts. Yeah. 
and then there are people telling you you know this has toxins and this brand is you know in the US known for being cancerous and then there is a little bit of fear element to it also mm -hmm. So when when there are five people telling you, okay, you know, here is this option where you which you can use, and you just jump onto it. I think it's a lot in parenting or in motherhood. It's a lot about about working on your fear. Yeah. So yeah. that is one thing that I guess yeah, led absolutely. to the brand success. Absolutely, absolutely. And and look, um, uh, if you look around yourself, you will start finding those trends. They are all around us. We just recently invested in a bubble tea chain. Right, where you'd imagine this is like this laughably small tam. How many people would want bubble tea in this country? No, no, all the young children. That's what are I'm saying. Like you realize over a period of time that uh, many of these things that seem like fads actually end up being very prevalent uh, and lasting, enduring businesses. Correct, correct. So bubble tea. That's interesting, actually. What else? What else are we looking at? Uh, so we keep, What's the next big opportunity, Sandeep? You know, so it's like this: we don't do top down, we don't do sectors, we do bottom up. You meet you meet a thousand startups, right? You will figure out con kitne pani mein, who's a good person, who's a good team, and is this stuff interesting, right? Mm. Agar hum, if we done top down, we never found the matter of policy bar because there were no sectors then. Yep. Mm. Okay. Mm. So the company, the company, uh, company was built, you know, right? and they were doing one lakh a month. So. What's a fad? What's a trend? I think that's a key thing to identify. And if and Kunal seems to be good at it, uh, you know, uh, if you can distinguish between a fad and a trend, and you'll get some wrong. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and many some would be a good outcome. <laughs> okay. uh, but you know, if you get a trend early, okay, you'll get in cheap. You'll get in uh, with less money for a higher share, and you'll be okay. You know, very important uh, on the point about you'll get something wrong. Because this podcast is about helping Young aspiring people, yeah. and you know uh, recent founders to navigate their early journey. Mm. Um, you know, you, you should pick investors who are okay with some things not working. Correct. Early stage investing is very high risk. Like the stage at which we invest, like which is the first money into the company. First, literally nobody else has written a rupee into the company yet. That's the only stage we enter. Being okay to lose money. And not fret about it is a very important attribute for a founder when they're looking for an investor, also. Mm. Because otherwise, you have very impatient, agitated investors that the first speed break, speed bump the uh, founder encounters, uh, the investor loses their <laughs> cool. No. Yeah, and and I think that can be even more disconcerting yeah. for the founder because at that moment is when you need someone who'll say, "It's okay. What's the worst? Money will go to zero, right?" Mm. Let's first problem solve and figure out. You do it. We are doing it. We are shoulder to shoulder, standing yeah. next to you. Yeah. Let's find a solution together. Maybe we don't find it. That's okay. We'll all go our separate ways. But you don't want investors who don't have that gravitas, that strength to take a loss on an investment. Correct. That can be very, very tricky and and uh, almost uh, highly debilitating for a for a company. Mm. I noticed that all three of you have that kind of. Whether it's called you call it patience, you call it endurance, you call it resilience, right? I mean, that's the only way you can build and support such large businesses. Is that an important personal trait to have also? I mean, because a lot of us have very different relationships with money, right? I mean, over the years, I'm sure your relationship with money has changed a lot over the years as well. But uh, is that an important trait to have uh, to be dispassionate towards money at at some stage? At some level, I think so. I think uh, it's important, particularly on this point of the founder-investor relationship. Mm. Uh, it's really important for the founders to pick investors who are in it, not just for the money. Uh, it is an important part of the journey for sure. That's mm. why the investors are investing. They're investing somebody else's capital many times, like RLPs are endowments funds, pension funds. So it matters, but that cannot be the front and center of your decision making, of your behavior. Of your of your journey, right? So that's why what does become important, and I hope founders pick investors like that, is that pick someone and the firm who truly believes in the problem statement you're going after, mm. right? Who is going to be patient? Who genuinely has a long term horizon? And honestly, it's not very hard to check. You can check behavior. You can check past hundred investments. For most of us, how we have behaved, not just in good situations. But in bad, I often, when uh, we are partnering with founders, I tell them, please don't call the the best situations. 
please talk to founders with whom the situations unfortunately do not go very well because mm. a, the true character really comes out in a in a tough situation yeah right? if you do that as a founder if you pick that person what that helps you do is as we have discussed the journey is not linear it has its ups and downs but your partner your investor will then be the right balancing force right supporter for you mm. when the chips are da- down you're feeling low people are not believing the the job of your partner and your investor is to say i believe and this everything too, will be good this yeah. too shall pass yeah. right and not just like that we let's work towards it let's yeah. find find the problem right uh and, and the person is willing to put the effort right uh, m- many a times in good times everyone is right there <laughs> okay. all the effort yeah. all the introductions but then the times turn and you know suddenly ro- the room is empty hmm. that's not what you are you should be looking for as a founder so how was your journey i mean uh, through it all sequoia peak 15 how did all of it start and how did you get here uh lots of luck and serendipity <laughs> and then uh, and then some skill hopefully so i was actually working in i love how you said skill at the end right? <laughs> <laughs> that Very is humble. Honest, that is honestly the truth uh, in this industry you have to believe in the fact that you have to get lucky as well um and i got lucky by getting here actually i was working at vcg one of my seniors told me hey sequoia is hiring for their analyst program and uh, at that point i actually thought sequoia some japanese company and fine <laughs> shot uh, i mean uh, 20 21 22 year old in 2009 like that's what it sounded like full full honesty yeah um and then i came in and uh, i was actually with my partners uh, this week and we were remembering the story and uh, i didn't know a lot about investing in uh, in france and somebody just like we talked about taking a leap of faith took a leap of faith on me and i joined sequoia and learned the ropes from uh, from my partners who i am very thankful of for teaching me uh, mohit ji v sharendra uh, how TJ. long were you at sequoia for so i've been here now since 2011 uh, sequoia and now peak 15 mm-hmm. and then continue to learn from my partners uh, from the founders uh, i work with many founders who are uh, we used to invest we still invest in very offline businesses uh, financial services companies and those have been phenomenal journeys to learn from profitability uh honestly about because that's the front and center um and then at some point i started leading investments uh in 20 early 2019 and got lucky that some founders chose to partner with me so a lot of fintech companies what you guys are also investing in at yeah. peak 15 right whether it's digit insurance razer pay you spoke about uh there's one card there's finova capital is card deco as well in ancillary spaces um you think that's a is is it a, is it become a little cluttered now though she financial services fintech is a very big thesis for us mm-hmm. uh and it's quite natural because say in in public markets today is give or take 4.5 trillion dollars of market cap uh almost 25% of that is financial services and this is true for most economies mm-hmm. financial services forms one of the largest segments um and that is growing that's mm-hmm. say compounding at 15% in india right so you can imagine it's cre- it should be theoretically creating a f- 150 billion dollars of incremental market cap if it's 1 trillion uh every year mm-hmm. so for that reason it is still a, in our mind a very deep market um and a market where consumers are actually looking for a better product more convenience uh and it's a market where you are dealing with money so you mm-hmm. can also make money it's it's very monetizable so it has been a deep sector of interest for us we investors in as you rightly said in insurance in digit and in payments in razor pay in pine labs before that in citrus then in brokerage and grow uh in credit cards where in one card cred mm. um and and many others uh, but i again you know coming to my point of penetrating the market right cutting through the clutter and i wanted your views on all of this there's so many apps so much happening now in fintech across the board as well how do you cut through the clutter i think uh, let, let me bring up the yeah. point kunal made which is having this deep focus on a maybe in the beginning a small segment of the market and many of these companies actually if you think of it started like that what did razor pay start with back in 2016 they started with saying i will focus on digital payments for online commerce businesses mm-hmm. at that point we didn't have 100000 commerce businesses right but it they focused on it and delivered the best product mm-hmm. what did cred start with we had 20 million cards 8 years ago uh, kunal started with saying i will focus on this segment this is the a uh, most prosperous part of the economy and i need to deliver a better experience better product for them mm. right um similarly what did grow start with grow started with a now 7 8 years ago 
a small focus on this mutual fund investment yeah. uh, population. It was not a, I mean, today we talk about uh, the number of SIPs and the flows. It was not yeah. that big eight years ago. But if you do that, it Actually, allows you to... Actually, if you look at it even now, right? Not even 10% of our population is investing yeah. in the, as a DMAT exactly. account. So even now, the runway is... The runway is huge. huge. The penetration yeah. not enough, uh, is not deep enough yet. Yeah. So what it allows you to do is focus on a specific market, build the best product out there, and then continue to keep expanding. And fortunately for all of us, India as a market is still growing very healthily. So you also have this nice buoyant uh, tailwinds uh, mm. which help you grow. Correct, correct. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the IPO journey because eventually every company, every founder has a dream to, you know, hit the markets, right? And you have seen 20 companies go the IPO route in at peak 15. That's right. So, what is it that take? What is it? What does it take for a company to get to that level? Yeah, uh, well, we, we have been very fortunate uh, to see those journeys, and honestly, very thankful for those twenty founders who uh, who picked us as partners. So, which are um, the big ones that you've seen? We saw Zomato, as uh, Sanjeev mentioned. Like Freshworks Mama, is the other one. Hunasa Mama Earth is the uh, is the most recent one. Um, there are a bunch of others such as True Collar, uh, GoTo in Indo Indonesia. Each of these are multi billion dollar companies. Um, so that experience has been quite valuable. Um, it actually see, starts at the investment phase itself. Uh, what we realized quite early is that India is, is a less deep market when it comes to MA. Mm. So, from an investor's perspective, particularly when we talk about large MA, uh, right? So, relatively, the IPO market is, is a more important route of generating returns for investors, maybe as compared to few other geographies such as the US or China. So even while making the investment decision and assessment, understanding of what it takes for a business to be an IPO-able company is very important. And we spend a lot of time hence on assessing the true economic engine of a company, mm. right? Uh, certain businesses will have bigger profit pools they are going after. Uh, as Kunal said, right economics, which will make them in the long term, high quality public company. So that's where it starts. Uh, but the second piece is also, finally, as founders run their businesses, uh, just making sure that the right economic engine and not just an economic engine, but a predictable economic engine is what they are building towards. Mm -hmm. um, and because we have seen a bunch of these uh, IPOs already, we're able to share our experience with them as well. Uh, on top of that, the way you run a private company versus a public company is also very different from a governance perspective, from a board perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so just making sure you are taking all the right steps in that journey. Uh, and then finally, at least in our case, what has happened is that, say we have 20 founders who have been a public company. Uh, that is a very important tribe. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen happening is that, say we have a founder retreat and uh, all our founders come, these founders who have already seen this journey are a very important inspiration mm. to many other founders. Mm. They share their journey. Um, uh, it creates that ambition, that desire for many other founders uh, to take their uh, company public and build yeah. these great cornerstone businesses uh, for their respective industries. And then very interestingly, what we have seen is that they help each other tremendously. Yeah. So even recently when Hunasa was going public, um, we connected Varun and his team to a bunch of other companies in the consumer industry such as Indigo Paints or Go Colors um, or Zomato who had gone public mm. and, and they're helping each other. Finally, they are part of the same ecosystem. Absolutely. Everybody wants to give back. Yeah. Uh, and this creates a snowball effect yeah. of then more successful uh, IPOs in our portfolio and henceforth. Okay. Kunal, you have seen a lot of companies as well from early stage, from zero to IPO, right? Hmm. Uh, wh what is the biggest lesson that you've learned or along the way these uh, founders have learned? I think the number one lesson is uh, just grit and resilience. Because, you know, we, we, all, we see these companies that start from zero and become, you know, lasting, enduring public companies. And we oftentimes don't, we forget the times when those companies and founders failed in the in that quest and if you ask me as a founder in hindsight the only times I remember are the times when I fell the times when I failed I actually don't remember even one moment of euphoria or happiness because by the time that moment of happiness has occurred that event has occurred 
as a founder you've already moved on to solving the next challenge so while other people are celebrating your quote unquote success mm. uh, we you know the founder is already um, you know focused on other problems mm. but we've mostly seen that the ability to keep going the ability to not get bogged down is the number one trait of any of these founders that eventually make it mm. uh, because too many give up along the way and is it also a function of what other people's opinions are of your business to a certain extent do you need to sort of shut the noise because there's so many opinions that you get every See, day world, from different stakeholders absolutely. right absolutely the world will always assault you with their agenda right and you can't get assaulted yeah. you need to be strong you need to have show that strength yeah. because if you know uh, you can't be uh, you know everything to everyone uh, all the time you just can't be yeah. and as a founder you have to take risks uh, every single day people will tell you don't do this don't do that this will not work that will not work but that's what a founder's job is yeah. you have to take risks every day some small ones or some big ones yeah. and uh, you know there's a saying that you must take risks in life if you win you can lead if you fail you'll guide that's what most investors do <laughs> <laughs> in the end so i, I would so I, if you win you lead if you fail you guide okay <laughs> i don't know i don't know sanjeev feels about that no i mean it's obviously true in some cases yeah. right but look uh, if you ask me a question on uh, exits and ipo i think look in india strategic sales are not happening at the kind of valuations if you leave out aside slip card at the kind of valuations that will give any early stage investor joy mm -hmm. right india is a conservative market on strategic sales correct uh, which basically means that public markets are the best way to exit as i shall point out only problem is that uh, from inception to ipo often takes a long long time in india so if you look at uh, info edge we took 9 years make my trip 10 years uh, and we were fast uh, i think uh, mama earth is fast 6 7 years 7 years yeah? yeah but you look at just dial i think 20 years look at uh, india mart maybe 18 20 years look mm. at matrimony 18 20 years look at um, most companies i think delivery is also fast recently but why does it take that long because you have to get to a certain size scale and profit before the market will accept your ipo hmm. and because public market investors are a lot more discerning on cash flow profit all right it is private market investors who are willing to take the risk who that listen uh, yes losses are part part of the course in the beginning uh, and the moment now the problem is that most vc funds are 8 plus 2 years 10 plus 2 years so very often if you go in as first check right by the time you get an ipo exit is beyond the life of the fund okay and and this becomes a challenge for venture capitalists in india to get exits which will get them the return that their lps are looking for okay unlike in the us and china where you get strategic sales at good valuations so you get exit halfway mm -hmm. before the company goes public right uh now our own ipo story so around uh, maybe late 2000 december maybe december 2004 jan 2005 uh i got a call from a friend who worked in morgan stanley hong kong and he said listen uh, can i come and see you mm. sure he came and met me uh, and uh, he said listen china's number one job site has gone public you know it's been a success five one job uh maybe it's time for india's number one job site to go public Now we got very excited. You had not thought of going public at that no, time. No, no, no. It was a dream. Yeah, going public <laughs> is every entrepreneur's dream. Every entrepreneur's dream. Okay, we my company now can be public company. Chala hunga. Hmm. I will take my company to its logical destiny, and that logical destiny is a public company. Hmm. Now some succeed, some fail. Some take longer, some take less time. But let me assure you, 98 out of 100 founders say my company can be public company. Chala hunga. Okay. So for us, it was like fantastic. Yeah. you know this is inbound interest i had not thought that we could go public at the size he says no 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 you are you can go public right so we went to hong kong met investors met lawyers you know right and 
we came back very excited, you know, saying that uh, yeah, we can go public. Okay. Now at that time, in, an Indian company was allowed to list either in the overseas or in India up to the company, mm. no restriction. Okay. Now the investors were very interested in us going uh, public in the US because we got a higher valuation. But okay. Uh, the bankers in Hong Kong very interested in overseas bankers very interested uh, US. The Indian bankers in India, mm. right? Because you know they handle Indian IPOs, right? And instinctively we were apprehensive of US markets, US regulations. You know we don't know it. US investors, uh, research analysts, we don't know it, mm. right? Uh, but there was going to be twenty five percent higher valuation in the US. Mm. Right. My logic was, you will get, you know, if you're not exiting the company, right, you will get that valuation in six months time because you're growing at that rate, mm. right. And it's possible that a US listing may distract the management to a point where your growth rate comes down. Correct. And that wasn't so good according Correct. to us. Correct. So, uh, as luck would have it, in June 2005, the government passed a regulation that an Indian company cannot list in the overseas markets without listing in India first. Yeah. So the decision was taken out of our hands. I was quite happy. Blessing in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> One of our directors put it puts this uh, nicely because until recently, obviously there were no listed new age companies. He said, "If you say jungle mein naache more dekhe kisne," which means like you have all these like beautiful companies in private market, but nobody's really nobody's seen. seen them in the public market yet. But now that's changing. That's I mean, completely changed. the completely number changed. of uh, you know uh, new age tech companies listing is growing by the day. I want to talk about qualities of leadership. Right. Eventually, if you want, you you spoke about grit, you spoke about resilience, and all of that. But eventually, as a leader, what do you think your biggest quality has been? Let me start with you, Vishal. I think it will be unfair if Sanjeev doesn't start. <laughs> it will be absolutely unfair if the CEO. Of no, no. Listen. So I think you know, my qualities. I think the the greatest quality of any entrepreneur, apart from resilience and persistence, you know, that uh, never said I, is the ability to create trust across the tables. Can you create trust with your co-founders, your colleagues? With your customers, with your investors and shareholders, with the tax man when he comes calling, with mm. uh, the media, with whoever, can you create trust across the table? Mm. Okay, create uh, trust across the table. Now that is a quality that you've already got or you haven't got. You can't suddenly acquire at thirty. You know, so not that kind of trust. Worthy, ban gaya. I'm going to two years. I'm going to make two years. Two years until I make two years. Don't see two years. Don't see. Don't see. Don't see. Fair. So fundamentally, people work with, they believe in, they do business with, they buy from, they sell to, yeah. people whom they trust. But that's actually a very big point, even with listed companies, right? I mean, the minute there is any corporate governance issue with any company, I've noticed this in you know two decades of tracking companies, that the premium that the company used to enjoy in the stock market is suddenly gone but and think, gone for years. But I think the uh, I would send you. Absolutely hit the nail on the head, saying creating that environment of trust is absolutely critical. But for uh, you know our young friends who are watching the podcast, they'll be like, "Acha, but I do this. How should I do it?" And actually, just one thing: communicate, 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 mm. and communicate the truth. Huh. Tell <laughs> the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. So correct, communication sure. and trust. Okay, got uh, that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I'm glad you brought it back to our uh, you know target audience, which is that young. Entrepreneur slash founder slash startup owner etc. Um, but so then I think let's talk about what do they need to do yeah, to build this yeah, trust, right? Yeah. Because they must be they're like oh, I believe that trust needs to be created. But what should I do? Yeah. So trust starts at the most basic level, right? When you just raise capital from some Titan Capital, let's assume, mm -hmm. or some other uh, early stage investor, trust begins with communicating your progress truthfully, mm -hmm. right? Monthly MISs. Showing up and meeting your investor once every two months, three months. That here's my progress. Here's what's going well. Here's not what's go not what's going well. Hmm. Communicating frequently with your team, either through monthly town halls, scheduling skip one on ones with your managers' reports, uh, with your uh, direct reports uh, uh, reportees on a regular cadence, where they are also hearing directly what's going on. Hmm. In the town halls, oftentimes. Founders tend to only want to communicate the best news, the yeah. great news, all the good stuff that's happening. Yeah. But giving a balanced view that, guys, this is what went well. 
but here are some things that we didn't do well. Yeah, but challenges. here is our plan hmm. of how we will achieve them going forward and we'll report back to you. Correct. Right. Correct. So um, with everything, it is important to, uh, with every stakeholder, very important to have a regular cadence of truthful communication. Communicate. And it's not hard to do. You just have to say, look, I have to set aside 5% of my time to do this. Hmm. And if I don't do this, you know, I can't, I will not be able to build trust. Hmm. You want to jump in on that? Yeah, I think uh, we completely agree on the piece of trust. Right? Mm. It's, it matters for all your stakeholders. It matters for your employees. It matters for your customers. It had to, matters for your vendors. It matters for your uh, investors. I mean, mm. people focus on the investor world, but the truth is that trust transcends all stakeholders. Like your certain vendors work with certain companies at better terms because they trust that company, okay. right? Like you can actually go in the market and ask every FMCG company loves working with DMART. Because they trust DMART okay. really, really well, right? Okay. So that matters. Um, in addition to trust, I think one thing we have seen as a common quality of leaders across companies is their ability to manage multiple dualities. Let me uncover that a little bit. So many a times there are certain pieces where we where we hear orthogonal points of views, right? So for example, somebody will say founders should be strategic, and somebody will say. Strategies are okay, but execution wala founders hmm. The truth is, the best leaders are able to manage that duality. Hmm. That they can form strategy, have strategic thinking, but also execute. People say, hey, you should be long-term thinkers. And then some founders will come and say, yeah, but uh, everybody's dead in the long term. <laughs> kya hoga? That's what matters. Are you able to manage that duality? Hmm. Plan for the long term, but also hit your plan, deliver your product in the short term. Hmm. Right? Just he, like he mentioned in your in your town hall with your employees. You have to tell the truth if things are not going well. But at the same time, how do you keep the inspiration of your entire team the long, uh, from a long-term perspective? Mm. This duality plays out many, many times over. Mm. Uh, good people are good at one of these axes. Great leaders are able to manage both these orthogonal axes. Okay, that's very, very interesting. So manage duality, communication, trust and uh, progress, right? One more. Uh, yeah. So look, good founders good entrepreneurs uh, who succeed over five, ten years. Uh, they're very good at spotting opportunity, chasing it, executing and doing well. Mm. Right? But great entrepreneurs who will succeed over 30 years or 40 years, right? they recognize that understanding and managing risk is perhaps slightly more important than merely assessing opportunity. Mm. Because when times are tough, it's how you assess risk and what risk to take, what not to take, mm. when the times are good. Correct, correct. So that you, will differentiate you. So you spoke about man, uh, about even finding opportunities, right? And I'm sure every young person out there who's looking to start his career is looking for the next big opportunity, as all of us are. So you spoke about Bobati, which is one opportunity that you maybe found from your experiences. But what else? Over the next five years, where do you see the next big opportunity? You know, it, maybe... One of the biggest themes, at least, that I think about is the underpenetration of brands in India, in anything. We are still vastly underpenetrated. Local, Indian homemade Indian brands. brands. In anything, service brands, product brands, any kind of category, we are still highly underpenetrated. And particularly, you know, one of the themes we, one of the, you know, ideas we think about is concepts which we call not my parents' brand. Right. So we feel that there is a reason why the Olas and the Aethers are taking off mm -hmm. is not only because they're electric and the carbon footprint concerns of Gen Z, but also because they don't want to be caught dead sitting on the same bike that their or scooter that their father was using. It's very right? embarrassing for them. <laughs> well, yeah. Or why a OnePlus phone? Like yeah. uh, it's, it's as good as a Samsung phone or any other phones are more or less the same. But, but why do you think that is? Is it because of brand fatigue? Is it because of just something new? I mean, why do you see that change? Because you're not the first person who's telling me this, that there is, you know, these legacy brands are now just relevance. dying. Hmm. Oh, it's irrelevance, you're saying. Yeah. Well, I think it's young people want to have their own identity as hmm. distinct from the parents. And it was like that when I'm 60 this year, but when I was 15, same thing, I wanted to be my own person. Hmm. So that's, that's natural human instinct. It's also because uh, many a times in majority, some, some brands 
to do a phenomenal job of it but most large brands also go through innovators dilemma you have a very large successful business and that unfortunately sometimes comes in your way of reimagining your business uh becoming more relevant for the new generation mm. if your brand which has a great customer base hundreds of millions of profit with your customer base now somebody comes and tells tells you but the new generation is coming you have to change your identity mm. the first question is but will that shake my current base do you guys have any examples of brands which are new age now and which are giving stiff competition to legacy brands which have been on for Mahat many years we spoke a lot about yeah. that's a perfect example uh, ola ather Mm. they are great examples i mean they're taking so much share in the newly created electric segment you'd think that the incumbents would have you know t- they have all the capabilities they okay. have the brand they have the trust they have distribution dealerships they have everything okay. all uh, associated financing insurance sab hai unke paas but why are they so these guys taking so much share mm. so in phone brands you're seeing the same in fnb you're seeing the same right you have you know burger chains that are doing well you know bubble tv spoke about in almost every category in fmcg also there are a lot of uh, new yeah, brands yeah absolutely coming. so in every category we are seeing this uh, challenging the norm pushing the boundaries on adoption and what is helped is that these digital native brands hmm. are able to target that initial cohort of highly loyal customers incredibly efficiently hmm. because they are doing it digitally they don't have to set up offline distribution incur large expenses so very quickly they are able to they throw a bunch of stuff see what sticks they identify who's their core audience mm. and then they grow it from there mm. right which is which could not have been possible in a pre digital era you either had to go big or you just you can't do anything yeah or take a look at nokri right yeah. we launched in 97 by the early 2000 we were challenging the uh, traditional media on appointment ads okay over time i think share shifted now 2024 we are worried that are the young companies and startups using nokri for hiring or are they using other means what are the other means it could be social media mm. right and we are trying to figure out what to do are you dealing with some sort of irrelevance in the potential of irrelevance in that sense so the fact that we are worried about it gives me heart that we'll deal with it mm. right if we had gone to sleep right okay let me give you an example early on in my career so in 1984 i joined lintas at u college mm. okay uh, was transferred to bombay worked for a short while on the in the san lewis surf account mm. detergent now the history was that in 1978 nirma launched mm. right with krishnan bhai patel making the product in his backyard and going by cycle door to door trying to sell it now what was the insight he was operating on so in 1984 when i joined intess surf was priced at 21 bucks mm. nirma was 7 rupees 50 paise one third people who could not afford surf used to use washing soap mm. for their clothes but the detergent was aspirational powder was aspirational yeah he said i will give you a cheap detergent which you can afford so that you don't have to use soap if you don't want to correct and nirma took off for the for 3 4 years a large company like lever said that yeah we're not in that segment he's in a different segment right uh, it's not our market it's not of our interest mm. right It took two, three years for somebody to say, "Hey, what's wrong with you, man? Look at the volumes he's generating. This is real competition." Mm-hmm. In 1986 or no, 1988, I think, uh, Lever launched Wheel, mm. a cheaper detergent to combat. It surf could do a little bit because of the Lalitaji ads and the ad campaign, okay? But you fundamentally can't fight a three x price difference for that segment of customers who. Will not buy this at twenty-one bucks. This is a very important point you brought okay. out. Yeah. So, so the company evolved. So you're saying that market leaders should accept change. That there is change. If you don't accept it, that's a first I mean, step, right, to becoming, to staying relevant. Yeah. So, so we, so at Nokri, we accept that perhaps younger companies, perhaps newer companies, perhaps younger founders, are not using Nokri for hiring the way we would like them to. Kunal, how do we on, it? come in on this? Yeah, how? so you know, one of the things that we do see in uh, one common thread between 
companies uh, uh, that work out is just sort of an old thing done a new way, right? In India right now, we don't have, while we are doing, there's a realm of the startup ecosystem that's focused on frontier technology, space tech, deep tech, biotech, etc., etc. But we are a country with, you know, mouth-watering opportunities, but eye-watering challenges, mm. right? To tap into those mouth-watering. <laughs> I like that. I, love it. I like that. Right? So, <laughs> Did you come up with that on your own? Uh, yeah, let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, you know, within those, one of the lowest hanging fruit we find is actually just existing industries delivering a better experience, mm. right? Better quality product, better quality service, um, you know, faster, or you know cheaper whatever like mm. digital maybe d using digital means of delivery uh, we feel that the lowest hanging fruit lies in doing the old things in a new way correct right we are seeing laundry detergent companies you would think that's a solved problem but then we have laundry detergent startups where we've also backed some that are growing like a weed right and you'd think what is the unsolved problem here mm. but when you double click you realize oh but People are worried that they have young kids in the house yeah, and, the chemicals, in the and the chemicals that they are using, the kid is first touching the floor, then putting it in his or her mouth. Mm. That doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Again, they're working on the fear of, uh, of the consumer. Possibly, right? but yeah. it's in, in effect an old thing done a new way. Correct. Right? Correct. So, and, and hence, uh, uh, while we must as a country push for more frontier technology innovation, some of the lowest hanging fruit for probably the next two, three decades will continue to be in just like boring industries done a new way. Done a new way. Okay. So the problem that we're facing here is, or at least we're discussing, is the possibility of irrelevance of a very good brand like Nokri.com. How do we sort of innovate and continue to stay in the game, right? What would your view be? As an incumbent or as a new company? Uh, as an incumbent. As an incumbent, ideally, have small teams which are empowered and can run like a startup. Mm. Finally, small teams which are very focused on a problem to continue to innovate, challenge the status quo, is one way. Would that mean younger teams as well? It doesn't need to be younger teams. It I mean, is, there's no age. Is, and nimble. Yeah. And nimble. So we're doing exactly that. Mm. We're doing exactly this. We've got small teams working on specific things. So, you know, there are something like 16 projects going on right now in Nokri on LLMs, right? Some of them will see light some of them will not. Uh, only one or two have been launched. Mm -hmm. So, continuous innovation, okay, uh, relevance, so that's, that's how you stay relevant, mm -hmm. okay? And we've done this for the last 25 years, every time. Mm -hmm. So, it's not that, you know, and it's a continuous process. So, for example, we have got a 41 strong team working on AI in Nokri. We have PhDs. Now, it's one of the largest teams for any Indian internet company mm. in this country. Mm. Okay? And we don't talk about it much, but they're continuously churning stuff which innovates, which improves the product. Okay. Okay? So it has to be innovation. Innovation, huh? And, and that's what we are focused on, and we, it seems to be working. So let me just get some quick thoughts out of the way before we wrap up. Uh, for that 20, 25 year old entrepreneur, slash founder, slash startup investor, Whatever, right? Be that, be that as it may. Uh, what is your biggest advice? What's your lesson uh, for them? And do you have any regrets in your personal journey that you'd want people to learn from? I lead an absolutely regret-free life. <laughs> I think you have, you make mistakes and errors which you must learn from. But you should absolutely lead a reg life is too short to have regrets. I mean, like one day it'll end and <laughs> all you'll have is regrets. Um, but I think. In the in the early stages, the only thing the founder should uh, probably focus on is, you know, as Ishan rightly said, and I think we've, uh, Sanjeev also mentioned, just have an idea that you can truly endure with over a 10, 15, 20 year period, okay. right? Many times founders in the early stages are in a rush to pick. They're going to spend 10 years of their lives on an idea and they'll spend 10 days on the idea. Right? So, spend at least 5% of the time on the pick mm. of what you're going to work for the next 10 years of your life on. Because what happens is when you basis some 
company that got funded in the US. You read an article on TechCrunch. This raised 100 million. Fastest unicorn in America this year. Like, chalo, yehi karte yeah. right? Ki funding to ho jayegi. Or kuch nahi. Um, but then what happens as you start executing on it, within two, three, four weeks or three, four months, you start losing conviction. Because you realize you didn't do the work okay. to figure out whether the market opportunity truly existed or not. Mm -hmm. And slowly the conviction wanes, founders start, co-founders start leaving, employees start leaving, and before you know, you don't have a business. Mm -hmm. And that just happens more often than you can imagine. In your journey, any such businesses where you thought had great potential at the start and then they just sort of, I mean, any, any that you remember offhand? I mean, they're countless. <laughs> <laughs> they're countless, but... Which is the one that hurt you the most? No, look, I feel that we, one of the beauties of being an early stage investor is that you end up meeting and working with such incredibly talented people, only very talented people, right? Self-driven people. And it does feel bad that when they have all the ingredients of success, but then when it doesn't work out, mm. because it's not, usually not because of them not working hard or them not having conviction. Sometimes it's externalities that they can't control, competition, regulation, etc. Hmm. That does feel bad, but you can do it again. Yeah. Right? That's the beauty of entrepreneurship. You can get up and do it again. Titan, I think we funded at least two dozen founders the second time. Right? Where the first time we made a zero, but we funded them again. And some of them have gone on to build very successful companies the second time around. Okay. Interesting. Your uh, final thoughts for that would, person watching you right now? Yeah, I would uh, see, as it has been mentioned, India is a now land of opportunities. So we have talked a lot about fintech, consumer, there are opportunities in software and AI and deep tech. So pick whatever you want to. And the only advice I would have is in this journey of entrepreneurship, find people who truly, truly believe in you, mm. not the market, not the company, not your valuation, but believe in you. Because everything else will change. What will not change is you. And it's a very tough journey. It could be a lonely journey. It's an emotional journey. So find those people. It could be investors, friends, employees, your parents, whoever it is. But just surround the, yourself with those people. And you are going to need them. Just hold on to them. Okay, that's very well said actually. Finally, from the godfather of the <laughs> <laughs> so listen, eco uh, ecosystem. I would say dream big, but start small. Right? It's okay to drift, it's okay to potter around, it's okay to experiment. So I quit my job in 1990. We launched Nokri in 97. For the first seven years, you know, I drifted near maybe 20 small things. It's trying to figure it out, mm. right? And then when you launched Nokri, it was one more small idea. Mm. You know, only 14,000 internet accounts in the country. It took us a year and a half to realize that, hey, this may be a big idea after all, and we stopped doing everything else. Mm. So it's okay to, it's okay, we'll get there. Folks, thank you so much for spending so much time with us and I'm very inspired by this interaction that we've had. Thank you for joining me. Okay, with that, it is curtains down on this edition of the Next Level Podcast. Until we meet again, have a great day.